Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, uh, depending on where you're joining us from. I'd like to welcome you to the Non-Applicable Clauses, Permissible Exclusions, Exemptions webinar, uh, developing a better understanding of what can and cannot be excused in an audit assessment. My name is Joseph Krolikowski, and I am the QMS Program Manager for Perry Johnson Registrars. A couple of notes for everyone today. Uh, all of our participants today are on mute. Uh, and ordinarily, we would be doing a Q&A at the end of the presentation, but I'm not feeling 100% today. So I'd like to ask our audience that if you have questions, uh, please put them together in an email. And you can send that uh, to either myself directly or to your scheduler. Uh, if you have questions on this presentation, I'll be glad to address them uh, in a day or two. And I do thank you for that accommodation. One of the more common questions that we get is whether or not the presentation will be available after we're finished. Uh, the uh, answer to that is yes, we do make the presentations available in two key ways. Uh, number one, if you want to get copies of the slides, uh, we do make them available for download on our website at www.pjr.com. That'll be available shortly after we're finished today. And if you'd like to rewatch this webinar with the voiceover, we host all of our prior webinars on our YouTube page, and that can also be accessed through our website. Our topics for today, we're going to be going over the concept of non-applicable clauses um, and where they come from, where the, the logic is. We're going to also review uh, some of the high-level requirements that are applied to this idea. We're going to take some time to discuss the concept of outsourcing and how outsourcing influences this idea. We'll have a review of how ISO 9001-2008 approached these concepts, and we're going to review outsourcing in the context of the current ISO 9001-2015 standard. Uh, finally, we've got some uh, items related to limited scope and how that can impact uh, non-applicable clauses and then a few concluding remarks. Now for today's presentation, um, these concepts are going to be reviewed as they are addressed within ISO 9001-2015. Now the idea of uh, non-applicable clauses or exemptions, uh, this is a concept that appears in all of the other major standards. It, it's present in AS9100, uh, to a limited extent in IETF 16949 and also ISO 1345. Uh, but in all three cases, there are specter specific requirements that are in play. Uh, now, if you're looking to learn more about those three standards uh, or others, we do have webinars uh, that are specific to those standards uh, where those type of uh, sector specific questions can be asked. So let's begin with what are non-applicable clauses. Um, now the, the phrase non-applicable clause is rooted primarily in section 4.3 of ISO 9001-2015. And here's how it's worded. It states that your scope, which is of course uh, what you are certified for, what you've built your quality management system around, uh, it needs to be very explicit about the products and services and it needs to provide justification for any requirement of the standard that the organization determines to be not applicable. Uh, so that's where the phrase comes from. It's actually written into the standard itself. Now, as you can see, 4.3 states that you need to have this maintained as documented information. You need to establish what your scope is. And in writing, you need to establish what your non-applicable clauses are and justify uh, the exemptions that you've taken. Now under ISO 9001-2008, this concept was referred to as permissible exclusions. And permissible exclusions was actually written into the non-applicable, or excuse me, the non-auditable portion of that standard in section 1.2. It stated that if any requirement cannot be applied, it can be considered for exclusion. Um, ISO 9001-2008 also added a layer in that it was mandatory for the permissible exclusions to be specifically included within the quality manual. 
And of course, ISO 9001 2015 does not have a quality manual requirement. So for today's presentation, uh, I'm going to be referring to these items uh, collectively under the innocuous term exemptions. I think exemptions, um, being as it's not a term that's officially used in the standard, it's very easy to understand, kind of rolls off the tongue a little easier than non-applicable clauses, if I do say so. So this concept is unchanged. In fact, if you go back to ISO 9001-2000 even, it's the same general idea. If an exemption is going to truly be justified, it has to be something that is not part of the quality management system as defined by the scope. So let's dig a little deeper and get a better sense of understanding how that requirement is formed. And we're going to begin with some high-level requirements that are applied. Now, some of this is more historical. Most of it is still very much in effect. Um, we're going to be reviewing guidance from the TC-176 committee. This is the committee that has authorship of ISO 9001. We're going to review um, part of a very special publication from the Auditing Practices Group, or APG. Uh, now, this is a, a collective that represents both ISO and IAF. We're going to be looking at content within the ISO 9001-2015 standard itself, both from the auditable and guidance sections. And I've also got some guidance for you from the uh, ISO 9001 guidance standard, which is the 9002 technical specification. So let's begin with a little bit of historical context here. Um, the TC-176 committee position papers. Now, back in October of 2008, shortly after ISO 9001-2008 was published, uh, the committee issued a couple of officially binding guidance documents. Um, they were intended to provide guidance on two specific items. Uh, section 1.2, uh, the application document. This is uh, uh, guidance document 524R6. And then also guidance document 630R3, which was guidance on outsourced processes. Now, these two papers taken together uh, introduced a requirement that uh, a lot of organizations, a lot of auditors, and even certification bodies found rather controversial. And the idea that was raised that was uh, so controversial uh, had to do with this idea of uh, justification for exemptions. So let's start with the statement uh, from 524R6. Examples of situations where conformity to ISO 9001-2008 should not be claimed include where an organization excludes a requirement on the basis that the activity has been outsourced. That is then further uh, explained in 630R3. The intent of Clause 4.1 of ISO 9001 2008 is to emphasize that when an organization chooses to outsource, whether permanently or temporarily, a process affecting product conformity with requirements, it cannot simply ignore this process and it cannot exclude it from the quality management system. So, in other words, any exemption that is rooted in outsourcing is not an acceptable exemption and it should result in a nonconformance. Now that is guidance from the committee that wrote the standard. There is simply no getting around it. Now, as I suspect some of our uh, guests on our call today are already thinking, the obvious elephant in the room here is design. Um, PJR has been a certification body for many years. And in the past, we have had clients who claimed an exemption from design and development on the basis that designs were being provided by a parent or sister or affiliated company. Now, those exemptions potentially uh, were not appropriate and should not have been automatically accepted. We're going to be giving a little bit of clarification on that in a few slides here. Um, but I want you to bear this in mind. There are two basic justifications for an exemption of design and development. Um, either first, the auditee is getting all product designs from their customers, complete product designs, mind you, or 
the Audity does not manufacture products based on a product design. So a warehouse, a distributorship, uh, a calibration service company, and so forth. Now there is a third option that we'll be exploring uh, a little bit later in the presentation. So this raises the obvious question. Okay, so you're telling me that if my parent company provides designs, I can't exclude design. Well, how are you going to audit something that doesn't happen in my building? Uh, and this is a refrain that we get not just from clients, but also from auditors who are frustrated over how we have approached this. Well, as a reminder, we're not auditing the actual design activity itself or the any other outsourced activity. We are auditing the outsourced controls that are being applied. So this leads into our next topic, of course, what is outsourcing? Now, um, it's important that we begin with a review of the definition that's provided in ISO 9000 2015. Uh, outsource is to make an arrangement where an external organization performs part of an organization's function or process. Now, that is key phraseology here. It is part of your function or your process, meaning that the organization still has ownership of that function or process, even if it isn't being done in their facility. And that's further emphasized in the note that's attached to the definition. An external organization is gonna be outside of the scope of the management system, obviously, but the outsourced function or process is within the scope and therefore cannot be claimed as not applicable in the context of an ISO 9001 audit. That's a very, very important point. So what are some things that we see uh, commonly outsourced uh, for organizations. Probably the most common item that we see is going to be calibration. Most of you on our call today have probably had to use an outside lab to do calibration service for you. We also see training as a very commonly outsourced activity. Um, obviously design as we've mentioned, outside manufacturing or product testing, even non-conforming product disposal. Uh, all very common outsource processes. Now to take a step back to ISO 9001-2008, um, outsourcing was primarily discussed in section 4.1, where it stated that where an organization chooses to outsource any process affecting product conformity to requirements, the organization shall ensure control over such processes. So again, this reinforces the um, idea, uh, the principal idea that um, the organization is ultimately responsible for the things that uh, it does within its quality management system that are performed by uh, the contractor uh, that they choose to use. Outsourcing requirements are also discussed in a similar fashion in ISO 9001-2015. Um, now for here, we turn to section 8.4.1, where it states that the organization shall ensure that externally provided processes, products, and services conform to requirements in very much the same way that it appeared in the prior section that we were looking at for ISO 9001-2008. Now this gets a little bit of further explanation in Annex A8. Now Annex A, for those that don't know, is a series of uh, official explanations, if you will, at the tail end of ISO 9001-2015. Uh, and here it says that all forms of externally provided processes, products, and services are addressed in Section 8.4, whether through arrangement with an associate company or outsourcing processes to an external provider. And again, um, this just furthers our case that again, if design is being provided by a parent company, it's still part of your system. It's been written into the standard itself that that is the case. 
Now, outsourcing is also discussed in a couple of other relevant publications. In the guidance standard, 9002, uh, it states that external providers could include the organization's corporate headquarters, could include associate companies, suppliers, uh, or someone to whom the organization has outsourced a process. Um, the auditing practices group, uh, they have an official guidance document called Scope of ISO 9001, and that document indicates that outsourcing is to be considered an input to the development of the organization's scope. So remember, when we audit an outsourced activity, we're not auditing the actual activity itself, but rather confirming that appropriate controls have been established. So what do we mean by controls? Well, you think about how you interface with those outside of your building. The controls that you apply are going to vary depending on the circumstances. So I've got a, a, a semi-complete list here of what some of those controls might be. Now, they might be official things like contracts or purchase orders, but it could be something less formal, like an email communication. It could be a set of work instructions that are developed for the outside uh, support. It could even be something elaborate like requiring the external provider to maintain a management system certification. For example, consider a company that chooses to outsource 100% of their calibration or verification activity to a laboratory. Now, what would our auditor likely review? They could review the contract that's issued to the calibration laboratory. They're certainly going to be looking at the calibration records that are issued by the calibration laboratory and definitely going to be looking at the gauge labeling that was applied by the calibration laboratory. Now, you'll note that none of that equivocates to a review of the actual calibration verification activity. Um, in that scenario, this organization would not be outsourcing any part of ISO 9001 2015 that pertains to calibration. In this case, it'd be Section 715. Now, I'd like to mention uh, something that PGR does as part of its due diligence. Uh, we are always careful to look at an organization's website, both as part of the audit process and as part of our review of completed audits. And when we look at a website, we're looking for a couple of key things. We want to know if the website accurately reflects what we have been told is the scope of activity within this organization. And we also want to confirm, does the website reference design activity, especially if the organization has been classified as no design? Now, if we note design on a website, and the organization is classified as no design. The explanation that we get usually falls into one of a few categories. Um, we may be told, well, our corporate office provides designs. Well, we've learned now that as a basis for excluding design, that's not acceptable. Um, we may be told, well, we don't really do design, but we want to attract potential customers by saying that we do. Uh, obviously, we understand your desire to grow your business. That, unfortunately, is not an acceptable explanation either. Uh, understand that your website uh, is considered uh, admissible as audit uh, evidence, and therefore, uh, it needs to be aligned with your design classification. Uh, once in a great while, we'll, we'll run into a company where we're told that uh, we did design our products, but it's been many years since we designed anything. In those circumstances, most of the time, uh, the organization is going to still be classified as design responsible, but potentially we may be able to reduce overall audit time uh, based on those circumstances. Now, one possibility for an exemption is if it is rooted in a limited scope. Now, most of the organizations that we have certified uh, it is their intent that their entire operation be included in their ISO 9001 certification, everything between the four walls. Now, there are going to be a certain number of cases where the client wants to have 
a more limited scope, whether it be for financial or other reasons. Now, where that is the case, it is possible that a portion of the standard may be considered for exemption that would not have been possible in a full scope situation. So let's take a look at an example here. Let's say that we have a clothing manufacturer and they have two primary product lines. They do uh, leather goods for industrial applications and polyester goods for commercial applications. Now you may recall that in ISO 9001-2015, there are some uh, uh, clauses that deal with warranty provisions. So let's assume that our organization here offers warranty on its polyester, its commercial brands, but not their leather industrial brands. Now, if this company was to only be certified for their industrial product line, they might be in a position to claim a full or a partial exemption from Clause 855 on the basis that none of the products that fall within their scope uh, are uh, subject to warranty provisions. That is a possibility. Now, in the context of an audit, if an organization uh, is claiming an inappropriate exemption, most of the time that's going to result in a nonconformance. Now, we already looked a bit earlier at what the probable clause numbers would be. Now, if you are cited a nonconformance for what the auditor feels is an in inappropriate exemption, you do have the right to file a dispute or appeal the auditor's decision. Now, that process is, dis is discussed in PJR Procedure Pro 10. Uh, which is available anytime on our website. Now, back in mid-2017, uh, PJR rolled out a new certification option that we called uh, Full Design Outsourced. And this was intended to be for organizations uh, that were receiving uh, designs from a parent or affiliate company. So, if you are classified as full design outsourced, here's some of the things that are going to happen. First of all, the audit time is going to be potentially calculated in the same manner that we currently use for companies that are classified as no design. We'll be giving clarification on that in just a few slides. Um, an organization that is classed as full design outsourced um, cannot claim any part of the design section of the standard as an exemption. And also, the certificate that's issued has to include design as part of the scope. It has to be acknowledged that that is part of the quality management system. Now, when PJR rolled out our full design outsourced classification, uh, we reached out to the ANSI National Accreditation Board, or ANAB, uh, to make sure that we had their uh, buy-in uh, to this process. Now, ANAB indicated that they felt what we were doing was appropriate, uh, but they emphasized uh, strongly that controls have to be applied to outsourced processes and those controls have to be included in the audit process. Uh, so quoting ANAB directly now, the complexity activities and risks that are present due to an outsourced provider of processes, products, or services need to be controlled or confirmed uh, in accordance with Section 8.4. And Section 8.4 uh, of ISO 9001 has many requirements that apply when the organization, uh, to the organization rather, and must be confirmed or evaluated when certifying that organization. Now the ANAB also indicated that they strongly object to automatic time reductions regarding product design status. Uh, and again, quoting ANAB here, in all cases, the certification body is required to clearly, effectively, and realistically justify and document uh, justifications for any adjustment, whether an increase or decrease in time from the established audit day table. So in other words, um, PJR cannot be expected to initially reduce audit time if you're classified as full design outsourced unless our auditor has been on site and has provided assurance that the controls being applied 
to an outsized outsource process are mature and effective. So we now have four classification options uh, pertaining to design status. And let's go ahead and review what those are. We begin with full design. Uh, this is any organization that is responsible for the design of at least one of the products that they manufacture. And obviously in this case, all sections of clause 8.3 are applicable uh, for a company classified in this manner. No design. Uh, this is going to be an organization that receives all designs from their customers or otherwise does not interact with product design, so warehousing, staffing companies, and so forth. Uh, in this case, all sections of Clause 8.3 are claimed as not applicable. Now, if you are receiving product designs from parent or affiliate companies, but don't have responsibility for product design, and you don't advertise or represent that you're responsible for product design, it is possible that you may still classify as no design, and that's taken on a case-by-case -case basis. We also have a third option entitled partial design. Now this is for organizations that provide technical input, review, verification, or other design services to your clients, uh, but don't typically have responsibility for final design approval. Uh, now we actually have very few clients that are classified in this manner. Uh, in this case, the expectation is that uh, a portion of Section 8.3 uh, might be claimed as not applicable, but not all of 8.3. So if you're providing input services, 8.3.2 might apply. If you're providing review services, 8.3.4 might apply, and so forth. And then, of course, the newest option, full design outsourced. Uh, an organization that receives all or some of its product designs from parent or affiliate companies uh, or subcontractors and represents that they are responsible for product design activity. And obviously, all sections of Clause 8.3 apply for a full design outsourced company. So in conclusion, PJR wants to ensure that our audit process is value added for our clients and we want to make sure that we address all applicable requirements. Making sure that exemptions are justified is an important part of that process. I'd like to invite you to tune in for one of our weather, other webinars. Uh, we have ISO 9001 2015 introduction. Uh, this is a very popular webinar. It provides a structured introduction uh, to ISO 9001 and gives you some insight into its key concepts. We have a presentation devoted solely to statutory and regulatory requirements and how these are reviewed in the context of an audit. And obviously we have a lot of other webinars, uh, everything from process mapping, stage one auditing, the interaction of processes, uh, and most of the other major standards. The best way for you to be kept informed of the latest news is to opt in. And to do that, you would go to our website at www.pjr.com, go to the bottom of the page, enter your email address, and click subscribe. You'll be automatically opted in uh, for latest updates on webinars, uh, updates to the standards, and other points of interest. I do thank you for your time and attention today. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, I'm going to have to beg your pardon that I will not be taking any questions. Uh, as I'm not feeling 100%, uh, but if you do have a question, please reach out to us um, and uh, the email will be forwarded to myself or another technical member uh, to provide you with further assistance. I do thank you for your time. Have a great day.